Hello, Matthew Bell with InsurancePrescription.com. How much insurance do you need? Today, I want to give you a very quick way of getting a fix on the answer to that question. I've covered this in some other videos. I did a video where I talk about trying to recognize hidden needs. I have a video where I outline five different methods for calculating insurance need. And if you want more in-depth information, I invite you to check out one of those videos. The five methods can either can be anywhere from simply tackling your insurance from the standpoint of the debt that you owe as a multiple of your income, using human life value calculations. There's something called the DIME method, D-I-M-E, a needs analysis that's more complicated. But in this video, I wanted to give you a simple schema for how to get a fix on the question. Now, you could simply be thinking through this for your own information. We're going through some crazy times right now as I record this. Or it could be in preparation for a meeting with an insurance advisor and you just want to get a sense of whether his or her recommendations are in the realm of the reasonable. So whatever your situation is, the schema that I'm going to present should be of some assistance to you, I think. And it's based essentially around an acronym, LIFE, L-I-F-E. So using the acronym, we're going to think through some of the elements that you might want to include in your own calculation for your insurance requirements. So firstly, we're going to want to think about debt. The L stands for loans, or you could think of it as just debt. So some very common sources of debt are going to include things like credit cards, medical bills, your mortgage is going to fall into this category, personal loans, student loans is another huge category, but it could also be other things. It could include unpaid bills, things you get behind on, maybe you fall into collections, utility charges perhaps that were not paid. And so this can encompass quite a lot. Now, when we think about the debt needs, what we're again, we're talking about not just general financial information, but we're talking about your insurance needs. So the question is, how much debt do you want to pass on to your survivors? Do you want them to have to foot the bill, or are you going to try and make some provision to make it easier on them, particularly if that debt is not forgivable? So some pieces of debt might just go away if you die, but other pieces of debt are simply going to be transferred to your heirs, to your beneficiaries, to your survivors. We often refer to those as cash needs. But in addition to that, you have to realize that if they only have enough money to discharge debts, that some survivors, particularly if they counted on your income, may fall into debt themselves very quickly if they don't have a replacement source for your income. So things like utility bills don't stop, grocery bills don't stop, even if you've given them money to pay for the mortgage, there's still going to be those additional charges plus property taxes when they come around, insurance and other things that just simply don't stop. So the second thing you're going to want to make some provision for is going to be protection for your income. And that's exactly what the I stands for. So the I, of course, income protection. Now here, you've got a number of different options. There's a number of different ways that you can go, but let's just think about some averages and just work through a few quick numbers. So the average salary in the United States, when I Googled it, looks like it's around $56,000. So between fifty dollars and $60,000. That means if you protected your income for one year, completely forgetting about taxes and other things, which I know would be included in the final ultimate analysis, but just to make the math easy, $50,000, protect that for one year, you're going to have to have a policy of $50,000 just for the income protection. That's not counting any debts or anything else. $50,000 policy, if it just went to protect your income, would last about a year. If you wanted to protect it for two years, you just double it. It's $50,000 times two, $100,000. And we can continue on like this, but let's say 10 years. 10 years of protection on $50,000 would be $500,000. So you can see that the policy values kind of ramp up very quickly. So for 20 years, it'd be a million dollars. Now, the question that you have to answer that I can't answer for you and an insurance agent can't answer for you is going to be how much protection do you want to actually put in place? So if you think you're close to retirement, you might fill that gap to get your survivor all the way to retirement on the assumption that your retirement plans are self-completing. Let's say you're 10 years off from retirement and you figure you're going to be able to work for that interval. And in that time, you feel good about the saving strategy you have in place. You feel like if you can simply get to retirement age, all the money will be in place that is necessary to get you and your spouse all the way out through retirement. That's the case, and you're close to retirement. Protect your income for that interval guarantees that that plan is going to go off without a hitch. Because if you were to die, your life insurance policy would replace the missing income, complete the retirement plan, and you're off and running. If you're younger, 
then you have a number of different options. Getting you out to retirement is going to be a farther distance. On the other hand, since you're younger, you're going to qualify most likely for better rates. But the other aspect of this is for younger people, they often have minor children, people who are depending on their income in addition to a spouse. So sometimes we think about human life value or the protection of the income is going all the way out to retirement age. But at other times, you can sort of index it to the emancipation of the children. So if you think your youngest child right now is two years old, and you want to get him or her all the way through college age, let's say the age 22, 25, whatever, but let's just say age 22, then a 20-year interval of time of replacing your income would be necessary so that if, tragically, you were to pass now, a policy that provided 20 years' worth of income to your family would enable your spouse to continue on in however he or she is living, and it would get your child from the age of two all the way through the age of 22. So now I'm just trying to get the wheels turning a little bit. You can see there's a lot of moving pieces. You can see that there are a lot of questions that you have to answer for yourself in terms of how much protection you want to be able to provide. But ideally, what you're trying to do is enable your survivors to continue with the same lifestyle that they had before you died without them having to go through a lot of traumatic changes or to scramble to make ends meet. But besides thinking about income protection and questions of how far off from retirement you are or how close to emancipation your children might be, another important consideration is going to be final expenses. And that's where the F part comes in. So the F stands for final expenses. And here basically we're thinking about end of life medical costs, burial costs or crematory costs, funeral home costs, and these kinds of things. Once again, I have separate videos where I go more in detail into each of these to think through the relevant calculations and to offer a few tips and suggestions. But the reality is everyone is going to die, and so these costs will come up. And for most people, they really, apart from the option where they're going to simply leave that bill for their survivor to pay, a lot of people are going to find themselves as having basically three, conceptually, three different options. Now, I'm assuming that you don't want your option to be a GoFundMe page and you don't want your survivors to have to pay for your funeral costs out of their own money. So given that, the three options that I have in mind are essentially these. The first is going to be to have them pay out of some cash account that you make available to them. Now, by cash account here, I mean some kind of an account, probably like a certificate of deposit, CD, a money market, a savings account, some account that doesn't have a lot of interest, but it also doesn't have a huge tax liability on it either. So if your funeral costs end up being $10,000 and you have a CD or a money market that has $10,000 in it and you've earmarked that for your funeral expenses, then they're going to exhaust those funds, be able to discharge the funeral bill. They won't owe anything, but at the same time, they're not going to get anything extra. Essentially for a cash account, for every dollar you put into it, you're going to get a dollar out or your heirs will get a dollar out. Now the second option is some kind of a retirement account. And here I have in mind something like a 401k or a traditional IRA, possibly a 403b, 457, thrift savings plan, TSP, whatever it is that your employer provides for you. This kind of a plan works a little bit differently. Because you get a tax break when you make contributions, you get a deduction, and then that money grows tax deferred. When it's pulled out, the tax becomes owed. So if you're hoping to leave money in the retirement account that your survivors will be able to use, you have to be aware that the tax liability has to be figured in. So for example, if your funeral bill ends up being $10,000, a $10,000 IRA is not going to be quite enough to cover the entire thing because your heirs are going to have to pay tax on the $10,000. So let's just say for every dollar in a retirement account, 80 cents comes out. Now, the Roth IRA is functions differently than this. It functions more like a cash account in this way. So we're going to leave that to the side. But just thinking again conceptually, that means that if you have a $10,000 IRA, after the taxes are paid, let's just say you have $8,000 left. If you knew your survivors were going to need $10,000 to pay for your funeral expenses, you'd have to leave $12,000 in the account, roughly in order for them to have the required amount after the taxes were paid. Now the third option is going to be the life insurance option. The life insurance option isn't as simple as simply going into a bank and opening a CD or going to your employer and starting to contribute to a retirement account. You're going to have to qualify for it. It's going to be a function of how old you are, what your health rating is, are you a tobacco user, and the like of these. So after you go through underwriting is the only time you're going to know whether or not this is going to be even available to you. But one of the attractive things about life insurance is that it's the only asset that essentially appreciates when you die. So for every dollar you have in life insurance, 
when you die, your beneficiary does not receive that dollar. They receive the death benefit that that dollar purchases. For example, for every dollar you have in life insurance, maybe your beneficiaries might get $1.25, $1.50, $1.75, $2.00. It's going to depend very much on how old you are when you purchase the policy and your health, but the idea essentially is that if it's set up correctly, it can be a way of giving you a discount on final expenses because unlike a cash account where you would need $10,000 in order to pay for a $10,000 funeral bill, and unlike a retirement account where you'd need to leave $12,000 in order to pay for a $10,000 funeral bill, in a life insurance policy, let's say you're able to put in $7,500 and get out 10,000 or you're able to put in 5,000 and get out 10,000 depending on your health depending on your age depending on the company and a lot of other factors but it's essentially think of it as a coupon for final expenses so it's one thing that you might at least want to consider and in order to explore the option you're going to have to go through the underwriting process for whatever company or companies it is that you are considering going through now the final letter is the letter e the letter e essentially stands for education fund emergency fund but i'm going to alter it just a little bit and say it stands for everything else everything else whatever else you want to make a provision for in your life insurance portfolio that's what that e is going to cover over so you want to talk about estate planning you want to talk about legacy planning you want to talk about providing money for kids or grandkids to go to college, possibly to go and buy their first car. If you want to set up a memorial fund for yourself from some hospital or charitable organization, all of that's going to be handled in that portion of this entire process. So a lot of these things are going to have to unfold, perhaps in a conversation that you have with an insurance agent, because you may not be aware of the various things that are available to you. Life insurance can be used for a variety of different, more exotic purposes, but this is going to give you a basic framework. I have other videos where I talk about some of those more exotic purposes. They're going to be more complicated estate and legacy planning situations, long-term care planning, possibly retirement supplementation, tax sheltering. There's a lot of really interesting ideas that appeal to a lot of people when they hear them, but they don't necessarily know about them. But for the time being, this should give you at least a beginning point from which to work in terms of thinking about your own situation. I hope that you're not too terribly affected by some of the traumatic things that are going on right now in the culture, but in terms of the life insurance portfolio, it's one of the things you're going to want to think through, and I hope that this acronym at least starts you off on that path. If you need specific advice, of course, you need to consult an agent or advisor who's in your area, who's familiar or is able to get up to speed on the particulars of your situation. This has simply been for general informational or entertainment purposes only. But if you found something of use, I invite you to like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you so much.